Great. Um, so the first uh, presentation is going to be from David Highland uh, from Texas A&M, an epitaxial, epitaxial device for dynamic interaction with the vacuum state. So come on up, David, and I'll get your uh, presentation set up here. Cool. OK. Can everybody hear? Well. Do you have the events again? Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Let's see. Uh, how does this work? Oh. How does this work? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Well, I am new to this group. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful to uh, Heidi uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm new to the subject, uh, you might say. Uh, however, I, I did originally think, uh, think about this uh, while kayaking on the Huron River. 20 years ago, <laughs> and it's been percol percolating ever, ever since. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I, I've uh, recently retired from Texas A&M. Uh, before that, I was in the uh, uh, University, University of Michigan as the department head of uh, aerospace engineering. Before that, at Harris Corporation in Florida. Uh, before that, at uh, Lincoln Lab and before that, MIT. <laughs> so that's my, uh, that's my history in a nutshell. Um, what is, uh, this is about, uh, no, yeah, how do I, oh. Ah. So, quite a few decades ago, uh, Casimir and Polder uh, explained the retarded van der Waals force in terms of the uh, zero point energy of uh, the quantized uh, electromagnetic field. Um, and then uh, there was some early work on uh, the pressure on moving mirrors uh, due to the dynamic Casimir effect, uh, which means basically take a mirror <laughs> and wiggle it very, very, very fast. <laughs> and uh, with a certain um, uh, a, a certain uh, wa a wave form, an appropriate wave form. Uh, and uh, then uh, you, will, um, you will see that it produces a thrust on the, on the mirror, or a force. So the early work uh, uh, on this took a perturbative approach uh, on the assumption that the mirror motion is uh, much less than shall we say, the wavelengths of interest or, or relevance. Um, the uh, early work also, in a side comment I have here, uh, might have some causality issues, but uh, I'll try not to dwell on that. In any case, so McClay and Forward uh, used this work to investigate the, uh, the effect as a, propuls as a propulsive mechanism. Uh, of course, due to the high frequencies of mirror motion needed to, to produce any, any sort of uh, uh, non-negligible force, uh, they concluded that uh, due to limited strength of materials, uh, the, the maximum amplitudes must be at nanometer level. Uh, now, uh, in terms of proving and showing that the dynamic Casimir effect is, is in fact real, uh, there's been quite a bit of recent progress, including uh, what's going to be presented tomorrow. And that's good. It's good to know it exists. <laughs> um, what this presentation uh, describes is the basic idea. And uh, I've been uh, busy developing analysis to support uh, the the, uh, the uh, formulation of specifications for a manufacturer of a uh, test item, a, uh, a small-scale test item. Just a, as a side issue here, uh, uh, here's a, a part of the old theory, and may, maybe, maybe Heidi and everybody already knows this, but um, that assumed that the, um, the motion is extremely small, and uh, the derived force per unit area on some sort of mirror is proportional to the uh, fifth time derivative of the displacement. Uh, the only problem with this is that, uh, well, this is, uh, suppose we have a mirror here that's just floating in space. Whoops. 
And uh, we poke it. And the issue is, does it move before we poke it or after we poke it? <laughs> uh, so this is a linear system. Uh, it has a, a, a frequency response, uh, the inverse transform of which is the impulse response. And for a causal system, the impulse response must vanish um, for negative time. That means it has to be a so-called analytic signal. Uh, so uh, uh, the con you need to use this contour on uh, that, uh, that uh, transfer function. And there had better not be any poles in the lower half plane. <laughs> so there, that's a problem. Otherwise, <laughs> there, there, there is actually a, a, a merit in that really work. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that later. Whoops. Yes. How, how did the coefficient, when you normalize the equation there, how did the coefficient on the fifth order term disappear? Did it like oh, um, uh, coefficients and uh, uh, we, we, the, the point is we can, we can formulate a problem in which a, a real mirror is, is floating in space and we can normalize the variables. I didn't tell you the details of the normalization, but you can do that. It is yeah, possible. It's not unclear to me how, if you normalize it, then one of the coefficients becomes one, but why does the other one become one? Both of them become one. Well, l l let's go into that detail later, because this is just a side comment. <laughs> Yeah. Now, how do you, you get around that problem with the fifth degree? I don't. I'm doing something totally different here. <laughs> That's the point. Um, uh, the background, of the, the, the main feature of the earlier work is that it, it assumed very small motions. Uh, and uh, it doesn't, uh, there's something different about uh, this uh, particular setup in which you have a stack of uh, switchable laminae uh, that requires uh, that uh, one have a theory for the dynamic Casimir effect uh, when the motion is large. I, in other words, not nanometers, but centimeters, okay? Without that, we're stuck. Let me uh, mention what the basic idea is uh, here. Um, I think we're all agreed that the, the effect is due to the motion of boundary conditions, not mechanical motion of a reflective surface. Um, and uh, at the same time, we, we would like to uh, uh, get a device that could give us fairly large motions, much, much higher than the, than the uh, nanometer level, and that it uh, doesn't uh, 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 doesn't involve uh, uh, I impossible materials. Um, and uh, over the past several years, there have been uh, quite, quite a few advances in either uh, semiconductors that uh, can be switched <laughs> from uh, color to color or reflectivity to transparency, or um, things like chiral liquid crystals uh, and so on. The, these are actually on the consumer market today. Uh, and that suggests the possibility that uh, you could uh, execute large motions of reflective surface surfaces with no mechanically moving parts. And so uh, what we, the idea is uh, to um, uh, have a, uh, a stack of, uh, of thin laminae that, uh, when energized, uh, switch between reflectivity and uh, transparency, okay? Uh, and uh, so these, these could be switched on and off in turn or in the desired pattern. Uh, and uh, if we 
want to uh, draw up specifications for material fabrication, we need to consider uh, large motions, and that's the, that's the focus of this talk. But of course, what we're proposing to do beyond this is, is to uh, get a manufacturer who knows how to uh, produce uh, within the specifications and try it out. And one of the things that excites me about being here is, uh, first of all, the idea that you can have propulsion without uh, propellant is fascinating. And I'm really, really excited about what you guys, what everybody is doing here. Um, and so, um, and I'm glad that I was invited to, to look at this. Anyway, uh, that's the basic idea. If I can get this thing to switch. Oops. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me that if you move a mirror, it Doppler shifts the reflected light. But if you have one level and then another and another appearing, it doesn't Doppler shift the reflected light. Is that a problem? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, because um, uh, actually, that's not the way we would do it. Uh, we would take well. The uh, the switching doesn't. I mean, there's a qualitative difference between a moving. Yeah. Of, uh, it, yes, there is. Yes, there is, and actually, uh, uh, if uh, uh, my idea is that if you, in reality, uh, the switching isn't isn't instantaneous. Uh, that means that uh, you can you could have a pattern like this. So the 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 layers are numbered. And uh, one, um, uh, this, this assumes that you have a very simple uh, rise time and fall time, okay? And uh, uh, the, um, the, sw the switching occurs in several steps. Uh, advancing the reflectivity front. Oh, thank you. Advancing the front of the reflectivity uh, at a certain level. And in this case, uh, with, with a very simple model, of course, uh, you get a, a continuous um, and, uh, well, a continuous, uh, uh, continuously moving front of reflectivity. Okay. Because if the, uh, yeah, yeah, if the transitions were instantaneous, you wouldn't have anything. It's quite true. Let's see. Now. Ah, whoops. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, concentrate on this talk, is is a very simple case, and, and but it, but it leads to fairly general results. Uh, so we have the stack, and uh, we're we're going to move it like a paddle wheel. <laughs> so the uh, uh, this guy in red is energized to be reflective. And uh, then the next guy, you know, this is a very crude, uh, just a crude diagram. Uh, so the front advances upward in the diagram and uh, accelerates. Uh, no, no uniform motion because uniform motion will not produce anything. Okay. And in all these equations, uh, uh, tau is just ct, that's the, the time variable. Uh, you, you imagine a uh, that the um, reflective surface starts at the uh, xy plane and moves upward uh, uh, along the z-axis uh, with uh, displacement q. And uh, uh, let's say uh, you do a maneuver that lasts uh, uh, t seconds, okay? Now, at the same time, uh, you have to take account of the transflection characteristics. That is, in these kinds of materials, uh, you have uh, the quiet state where it's transparent, and you have the uh, energized state where typically it's, it's reflective, or you could have vice versa. Uh, this is a, a data on a commercial product, actually. <laughs> um, and in this case, let's see, if, uh, if, uh, if the, uh, in the quiet state, uh, its uh, uh, reflectance is about uh, roughly 90%, uh, and its uh, transparency is, uh, well, its uh, uh, transmission is nearly zero, and vice versa. 
So if we, if we uh, turn up the voltage, uh, we, we turn off the reflectance and we turn on the transparency. Uh, and this occurs over a, a particular uh, band of wavelength, okay? And that's the idea, is to have a material or a setup that is able to make the switching at least in some band of wavelength. Otherwise, otherwise of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the stack is simply a dead brick. It doesn't do anything. So I'm going to model this now is simply, very simply, uh, with a, a, a reflectivity coefficient, just for modeling purposes here, either zero or one in, uh, in, in uh, some wave number band here, okay? So that's all the, the, the setup here. Uh, now, you know, it's probably not such a bad approximation for first order, I, I would think. Whoops, let's see. Uh, so the, the, the way I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm just going to calculate the average force. That's, that's all, that's as much as I can do <laughs> at this point. And uh, using the Heisenberg picture, where the initial state is fixed uh, at, at the vacuum state, and the operators evolve in time. And then uh, we set up the operator that, resents, uh, that, uh, pre uh, that uh, represents the uh, force on the moving mirror, and uh, take the quantum average with respect to that initial state. Uh, I'm using the continuous Fock space representation. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, whoops. And in that representation, uh, uh, you see that the, uh, uh, the electric and magnetic field operators are, are expanded basically in a set of plane waves. Indeed, uh, uh, each of the modes of the the, the uh, uh, vacuum state uh, are essentially plane waves with all possible orientations. Uh, and um, uh, each one has that one half H nu <laughs> energy. But uh, uh, let's see. And also in this formulation, uh, uh, we take two possible uh, uh, linear polarization states. Uh, th that is okay, it's, there's enough generality in that. Well, and what, what I do is, um, uh, in, in, in place of the usual uh, uh, approach, I, I would uh, determine the evolution of the, uh, these operators. Uh, basically because uh, I want to visualize the fact, I want to be able to get a feeling for how the space-time coefficients of the evolving annihilation operator, right? How that evolves in, ta in, in time and uh, uh, what it looks like as a plane wave, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna do that. And just remember then that, um, uh, ag again, the, the initial state is, is uh, the vacuum state. Uh, the representation is fixed. Uh, and so all of these, uh, these operators depend on uh, wave number k. And indeed, uh, the wave number k is a tag for the, the representing that particular plane wave that exists in the vacuum state, okay? So the idea is to, for each such, such plane wave, we, we find the evolution of these operators in time. And uh, this uh, says uh, the same thing, basically. Uh, we start out uh, in a sort of one-dimensional uh, illustration. We start out with uh, uh, waves going uh, uh, one way and another going another way, right? With a particular wave numbers, wave number tags. Then suddenly we turn on one of the lamini, and pop, there's a mirror. And now the, uh, the guy that's labeled with a, a plus K uh, suddenly has to uh, make a U-turn 
and it uh, evolves into a reflected wave. Okay? And likewise, the, the other guy going from uh, right to left is making a U-turn. And, and clearly when uh, at, 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 at uh, tau distance from the origin, um, uh, you, you have everything that's worth considering. Outside, outside these limits of minus tau to tau, nothing's going on because uh, the momentum of everything outside this is zero. <laughs> so that, that's a, 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 a simplification. Uh, now, right up front, I'm gonna, I, we're, main assumptions of the total amplitude of motion is much larger than a wavelength. So the, the career of this moving uh, reflective surface is quite large compared to any wavelength that's in the active band of the device, okay? And in one period, uh, the field operators evolve uh, 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 very slowly, okay? Uh, now, uh, we can put this in the form now uh, of a, uh, uh, of a uh, uh, formulation for the electric and magnetic field operators uh, in terms of what, what, what is basically a, a, a transverse vector potential uh, with, um, with these initial conditions. So it's basically uh, a plane wave times a polarization vector, okay? Um, and by the way, uh, again, I, I use uh, a representation that uh, assumes that uh, these operators represent analytic signals. Because uh, for an anal analytic signal, and in the case of this sort of slowly varying, or s slower varying amplitude and phase, um, the uh, analytic condition uh, produces uh, the, the smallest variation. Okay, so it's uh, m more uh, uh, suited to, to this kind of operation. So what we're gonna do is uh, uh, we, we look at the Lorentz force operator, uh, we take a contour in 3D, uh, we, we let the, we, we have a cross cut and we let the, uh, uh, we let the circle go to, go to infinity and we obtain the uh, expressions for the, uh, 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 the forces on the field, and that leads to the force on the mirror. Um, so it's a lot of stuff, and this is, of course a, is, in the, is in the paper. Uh, and then, of course, uh, one, one notes that uh, all of these terms are quadratic, in the electric and magnetic field operators. Uh, so then we trudge ahead, the, you know, the crusade continues. <laughs> and uh, so this is an example of just one term. And uh, then finally taking the quantum average, using uh, uh, some identities here and, and the commutator, we get in this case a, a single term, but it's quadratic in, uh, in this field variable, which represents a kind of pa plane wave <laughs> evolving in time. Uh, now, by symmetry, there's, there's only a Z component to force. And, uh, well, since Z bar is assumed much less than the lateral dimension of the stack, uh, I'm gonna assume no, no edge effects. So we have a flat plate sort of thing. And um, taking the quantum average, uh, uh, the, uh, the average force uh, is given by this horrendous kind of expression, but you should have seen what uh, preceded it. Uh, <laughs> however, it, it's all, notice it's all quadratic, and, and every term, in fact, has this factor. 
it's the integral of the reflectivity coefficient, which we assume zero or one, times the wave number cubed. And that's very important. And uh, this tries to uh, uh, show you the general character of these mode functions when the, uh, en the energized uh, uh, front uh, advances with acceleration. Let's say a power law. It starts from zero. It appears suddenly, it starts from zero. It goes to the end of its stroke, and it's turned off, okay? And uh, the, so you might have, uh, this is in the vacuum state, you have the vacuum state modes, let's say, that have uh, angle of incidence theta, okay? And um, uh, as this goes along, uh, the, the, uh, the reflected waves uh, are simply the reflections of the initial, of the, the, the initial uh, reflection event occurring uh, when you turn a fir first turn it on. So, so out here in, in, uh, in, in the spatial domain, you have a map of the history of uh, the uh, acceleration of, of the mirror type surface. And what tends to happen as you accelerate, of course, is that the angle of reflection becomes larger <laughs> as you accelerate. And uh, the angle of reflection on the other side, the, the, the advancing side, uh, tends to align more with uh, the z-axis. And so you have this asymmetry, okay? Now, if the, the velocity is constant, the asymmetry cancels. <laughs> but if you have sufficient acceleration, uh, it remains, okay? So um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the reflective surface is experiencing some kind of force, okay? Uh, a change of pace. Uh, just to make sure that we're not uh, doing something wrong, uh, let's do a dimensional analysis. Yes? So in the actual uh, space propulsion proposal, where is the initial wavefront coming from? I'm, I'm going to talk uh, to that uh, in the rest of the talk, actually. I'm going to show a, uh, an, a, a class of motions and uh, give you a formula for computing the force. Where is, where is it, what, where is, what is the source? Where is the, what is the source of the wavefront? The, the, the initial wavefront? The, the, va the vacuum modes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Well, okay, I guess I still have a little time. Uh, let's see, well, dimensional analysis. What if we don't know anything about this at all? Uh, except that that if we have some kind of waveform, some sort of, th there could be a non-zero force, okay? And the trajectory of this, th this uh, waveform is normalized with respect to its duration and its maximum amplitude, Z bar. Uh, so apart from uh, dependence on the normalized uh, trajectory here, what is, the, what is the force per unit area of uh, the quantum average force and also averaged over time? So in other words, what's the average force? Uh, what's the force divided by the duration T tilde, okay? So what's the total moment, what's the impulse, in other words? Okay, well, uh, we need uh, kilograms, meters per second squared, meridian squared, right? That's force per unit area. Obviously, we need H, because otherwise there'd be no quantum effect whatsoever. And that gives us uh, a need for an uh, additional factor, uh, a meter cubed, one over meter cubed second. But every term of this force has this integral over the uh, uh, wave number, wave number space of the original vacuum state. So you must have that. 
you must. <laughs> Which leaves us with uh, the need for a, a component that is a, a velocity scale. Well, you could substitute C, I suppose, but, but the fact is that um, uh, this won't do because you know that, that if, the, if the velocity here is zero, there's no force. <laughs> if Z is zero, there's no force. <laughs> So the velocity scale has to be z bar over t tilde. <laughs> and uh, so, so we get this expression. Now the difference between this and the earlier work, uh, basically, is that um, if, if you do the calculation in, in detail, in general, and you say that uh, the, uh, the wavelengths that might, might be involved are gigantic compared with the amplitude of motion, then you can show that this force becomes asymptotically independent of wave number. If that's the case, we, can, we could redo this whole thing <laughs> here and replace this factor by uh, omega over C, where omega is the frequency with which we re repeat this wavelength, this, this uh, waveform. And that's maybe the, where the earlier work got kind of confused because uh, basically it's omega over c here, not, uh, not uh, q to the fifth power of uh, the fifth uh, derivative. But anyway, uh, all that said, um, the, the earlier analysis does establish that the, at least theoretically, the Casimir effect is real. Uh, uh, Take the, the now. So uh, let me uh, use a one dimensional approximation to illustrate a few factors here. Um, so we define spherical coordinates in the K space, uh, where uh, theta is, is basically angle of incidence, uh, it's, it's the uh, co latitude, and phi is the azimuth, you might say. And uh, then um, uh, put the force in, in terms of uh, uh, the integral over uh, the uh, uh, spherical coordinates. And, and again, in both, both of these terms, you have that uh, wave number integral. Um, and then what I do is uh, basically say, well, uh, I'm going to guess <laughs> that most of the integrand in this uh, directional integral is uh, well represented by cos theta. <laughs> because I feel, well, most of the momentum, if it exists, should be in the z direction, okay? Just a guess. <laughs> but if you, do, uh, if you do that and then uh, uh, proceed to ignore the z component of the, of the field variables, then you got a one-dimensional problem. And it has, it's properly scaled in terms of dimensions and that sort of thing. Um, and then you solve, uh, now, in the one dimension, uh, you basically just have one scalar uh, uh, wave equation to solve. So uh, there, there it is. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. And uh, oh, a little note here, uh, uh, it, you can compute this with a sequence uh, which converges for all v, v less than one. But by the way, V is the, the velocity, the, the speed of the, of the, the, the reflective surface divided by C. So it's, it's uh, between zero and one. Okay, so, uh, so remember now, uh, as shown in the di that diagram, the appearance of a reflective surface that we assume is very, very large ba basically divides uh, the whole space into two parts. So we're concerned with uh, 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 sort of two halves of the problem. And again, we assume the total amplitude of motion is much larger than specifically those wavelengths within which the device is, is it, it can be activated. And in that data that I showed you that, that for example, that, that's somewhere between uh, uh, 0.7 micron and 0.3. And that's a commercial product. Anyway, 
But suppose you uh, now examine uh, one of these terms in the force exactly, uh, you'll get uh, expressions like this, where S is really the iconal. It's, it's the phase function. It's the iconal. And, and it's a smooth function. And you have that multiplying one, you have that multiplying cosine terms. Okay. Uh, in our case, where the motion is large, uh, the cosine term, terms average out. I mean, they're, uh, uh, deleting them has negligible impact. But, on the other hand, if, uh, if the wavelength is much, much larger than the amplitude of motion, you can show that the cos 2 tau part is dominant. So you have a k integral, <laughs> cosine integral over time, cosine k two tau. So the, the result of uh, the, the uh, force expression is that you get get something very very like what Neto and all his colleagues got. So in that sense, it makes sense. It it, it matches up. Uh, but the, uh, another big point, of course, is if the motion is very large, then uh, I can almost use an iconal approximation to, to approximate the, um, the, um, uh, the, the evolution of these uh, uh, wave functions, uh, okay? And that's what I'm going to do. But anyway, in 1D, here's the force expression. And uh, you, you can see the effects of a, do a Doppler. Whoops. <laughs> oh, heck. Ah. And um, of course, this is going to be appearing in the paper. Um, the expression that we have uh, agrees with the dimensional analysis. And uh, the, the uh, function uh, lambda uh, depends indeed only on the past history of uh, the uh, speed. Uh, this is uh, this model is uh, causal, <laughs> and it has all the right uh, dimensions. And uh, the, again, the, well, the the function lambda epitomizes the uh, asymmetry of a trajectory that has sufficient acceleration. So uh, I looked at uh, cl a class of accelerating motions. Uh, uh, it starts at zero and, and proceeds by a power, power law. And I, uh, d d I um, uh, parameterize it uh, uh, with the exponent n and uh, the maximum speed at the end of the maneuver, v bar. So obviously v bar is less than one, <laughs> between one and zero. And uh, here's a little series development, which converges quite ra uh, rapidly. Um, and here's an observation that the change in the normalized velocity in one period of a wave, with wave number k, is basically the ratio of the wavelength to the distance traveled uh, by light in the duration of the trajectory. So indeed, <laughs> uh, if uh, wavelengths are uh, in the active zone are much smaller than the motion, they remain smaller, much smaller than the motion. And the iconal sort of approximation holds up. Uh, but here's the, um, here's a graph of uh, lambda, or actually minus lambda, because when I, when I push up, uh, the force is down, like a paddle wheel. <laughs> and uh, so we have a rapidly ac accelerating uh, uh, dependence here. This is minus lambda uh, for the, now n, n equal to 20 uh, uh, shows that, uh, it, it shows that indeed uh, as n goes to infinity, there's a, an upper bound, okay? And then we tackle the three-dimensional problem. 
and here the, the critical thing is to calculate uh, the, uh, uh, well, when I say iconal, I mean, first of all, phi is indeed a plane wave, both in, both in uh, 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 incidence and reflection. Uh, in, on reflection, of course, though, it changes, uh, it, it changes frequency <laughs> and to some extent amplitude. So we have to calculate what uh, the main thing is to calculate the reflected waves on either side. Uh, and again, uh, in the diagram, uh, the motion is uh, supposedly uh, from left to right. So you can see, by the way, that uh, the uh, uh, reflected wave numbers uh, must have, if the angle of incidence is the same, they must have the same uh, lateral magnitude. If they didn't, then in the, frame, in the rest frame of the reflective surface, you would see a force tangential to the mirror. And that certainly violates the idea of relativity because in that case, you, you could, uh, in the rest frame, you could determine your relative motion with respect to a non-existent uh, field. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so these calculations are uh, j just a, the solution, a, a relativistic uh, solution for the, uh, the reflective conditions. And, uh, and then, this is far too complex to finish in the time I have, but anyway, if we, ex if we extend all this, um, we get something very, very similar to the one-dimensional case, uh, except that uh, as this thing accelerates, the forward, forward half reflection tends to align with the z-axis, and the backward-facing uh, half uh, reflection uh, tends to increase the angle of, uh, the, the angle of departure. And um, uh, that increases the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, sen the sensitivity. So, uh, but I'm too lazy to calculate all this, so uh, I decided to find upper and lower bounds. <laughs> and so what I'm saying here is, is that if the speed is, is very close to one, or the speed of light, then uh, I can get a uh, lower bound. Oh, by the way, the lower bound looks exactly like the one-dimensional approximation, so that makes it easy. <laughs> and um, uh, then if, uh, on the other hand, if uh, the speed is much less than one, it's very low, then I get an upper bound. And all that adds is, a, is the factor of two. So uh, by lucky accident, uh, one can, uh, let's see, oh, where was, uh, oh, I had a, a diagram of what that looked like. Oh, darn. Um, anyway, uh, so what we're going to do is uh, simply use the one-dimensional approximation formula that we had and, and show some stuff. Now, um, let's see. Uh, now there's one more thing though. We're gonna repeat a, a waveform, but if we repeat it uh, immediately, there's a backwash. <laughs> so, so, I create a mirror here and I force it to accelerate over to here, okay? Then I turn it off, and I create a mirror over here again. Well, this guy is going to see the reverberation from this guy, unless you wait a little bit. <laughs> if you don't wait, there'll be uh, a little force in the positive direction. <laughs> so uh, that's the, the caveat here. So you have to, you have to wait. 
And uh, so you would have a, 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 you know, a, a train of, of waveforms like this. And so, whoop, and then this just shows that uh, if you do that little integral on, on the, uh, on the um, uh, reflectivity as a, as a function of wave number, uh, it's heavily skewed toward the, the top end of the, the wave number space. And in fact, it's very sensitive to the wave number space. Uh, uh, the, 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 the top end of, 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 of the, the, uh, the, 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 the low end of the, the uh, wa uh, wavelength. And, uh, and then beta here is uh, basically uh, the, the average speed corrected for this delay. Okay, so it's, it's basically uh, uh, beta for the, whole, for the whole trajectory, including the downtime. Um, and so what does it look like? Uh, so here I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, a, uh, a high wave number limit that's basically in the 0.3 micron range. Uh, and a lower one down at 0.7 uh, uh, wavelength, uh, I'm sorry, lambda equal to 0.7, flip that over. Um, but it's really the uh, high end that has the most effect. And it's quite, uh, as I'll show a little bit later, it's quite sensitive to that. But assuming uh, a particular wavelength active band uh, here's uh, the magnitude of the average force per unit area, newtons per square meter, uh, versus the uh, highest speed during the maneuver, which always, always occurs at the end, of course. So, um, hmm, there it is. So if we operate uh, very near the speed of light, which of course is gonna be very difficult, <laughs> we could get something fairly significant. Um, this shows uh, the results for, for exponents that are uh, integer and greater than two. And then this shows uh, uh, fractional uh, exponents starting from two and going to 1.2. And of course, uh, when you get to one, uh, <laughs> it's only zero, so. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it almost appears, though, that uh, in this uh, class of power laws, n equal to 2 does the best, by at least a small margin. And uh, I show this with great trepidation, uh, because... <laughs> You know, the, the odds I'm going to be proved wrong are overwhelming, <laughs> but, but uh, anyway, this is what uh, the formula I would tell you is the, the influence of the high end of the wave number active band. And uh, it, 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 of course, is extremely sensitive to this. Now, this is, this is uh, plotted versus scan frequency. Uh, and uh, so it's very difficult. Uh, and and the, I, th I think the limit of uh, semiconductor switching technology is like th three uh, gigahertz, something like that. So to get up here, we'd have to work very hard. But um, maybe for a low level experiment, we can get something that, that is outside the, <laughs> well, that is within the range of detectability. And so, my next task, of course, is to uh, get a manufacturer to produce a small-scale model and actually test it. Uh, you know, uh, at this point, uh, one has to try; it just has to try. <laughs> so, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, another uh, benefit, if, if this actually works, is uh, that uh, you can do all sorts of tricks uh, and. Uh, combine uh, these just simple acce accelerating motions with, with uh, sort of 
uh, cavities. Okay, so you could, uh, in this case, you could uh, have create two of two two uh, reflective surfaces, and ram one accelerating against the the next, and then turn the turn the end guy off, <laughs> and do it again. <laughs> so this might uh, result in a, a, a amplification effect. Just an idea. And then, of course, you could uh, you could combine uh, you could combine the cavity idea with uh, with the acceleration idea and have an accelerating cavity. Uh, all sorts of combinations could be investigated here. Um, and uh, well, that's really the end of my talk. So let's see. We still have some time, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, and so basically, uh, uh, I've shown you some of the analysis uh, uh, of this old idea of mine that I, I got really interested. And by the way, I got interested in this. I reinterested in this idea when I read about uh, Sonny White and the, uh, the the work on M drive and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, can you tell me about conservation of energy? Where is, is the energy? Are you extracting energy from the quantum vacuum? I don't think so. No. <laughs> so the reason why not is why. Well, where is the energy coming from? The energy, ha uh, some energy, I believe, ha has to come from an external source. Okay. It, it, Okay, here's my, uh, maybe you guys can help me with this. <laughs> because uh, I've only calculated the quantum average force. I haven't said anything about the state, how the state of the field evolves. It's quite likely that, well, at the end of each maneuver, the state of the field is not the vacuum state. It's a higher state. <laughs> It has photons. So, I mean, in general, one would, uh, uh, I would tend to believe that basically, it's not that this is interacting with the vacuum state and drawing energy from it in, in that sense, but it's really mediating a, a connection, a, cat, a, a catalysis between some energy source that you're pumping in and the reaction of the, the field in its vacuum state. Okay. But it's starting with dark virtual photons and ending with real photons. There must be energy involved in that process. Yes. Yes. That's what I think. So where does the energy come from? Does it imply Solar? <laughs> does, does it, does it imply Nuclear? <laughs> does it imply a time variation of the fine structure constant? I don't know. I think that it does. Well, uh, well, let me state let me state my quandary uh, now. Uh, okay. Um, so it certainly ta it, it would seem to me it takes takes plenty of energy to run this thing if you get very large forces. On the other hand, uh, I know that the uh, it only takes a few watts to, to switch one of these thin film devices. And that ends up in heat, as heat in the device? Yes. Yes. Which distorts the device. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm sure, yeah, that's true. Now you're not incident anymore. But, uh, but assume it doesn't. It yeah. ends up a heat. Therefore, that is not energy that is going into, into the propulsion. I, I, I would s suppose not. Because yeah. it's going to keep. So on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, uh, th this idea that, that that the propulsion is produced by photons. <laughs> on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to me that <laughs> where's the mechanism by which this thing would. And it's exceeding draw a lot of energy. <laughs> is it exceeding the? Um, the propulsion of a, photon, of a perfect photon rocket? Uh, I, I believe so, but I, I don't know. 
Yes. Could I? The part that I'm still confused about is I understand um, what can happen with the moving mirror, but you have a case where you go from discrete relocations of a static mirror and how that varies the map. Yeah, yeah. I, I found well, that confusing. That, uh, I'm not sure how to wrap my brain around that. Yeah, that's what I was asking earlier. <laughs> Well, okay, so, so each, uh, each lamina doesn't uh, switch instantaneously. It goes continuously from uh, off to on, okay? Now, the, but these the equations are, are, yeah. have a velocity term. That's a kind of a relocation, which a, in, Well, what I'm saying is that uh, this arrangement and, uh, and uh, choosing the, the size of the lamina and their, uh, uh, their, their uh, delay time, their on time, appropriately, gives you a continuous movement of the reflectivity. Okay, the reflectivity of the whole. I think I see what you're saying. Let me so current that back yeah, and see if, if I get it. it. Even the thing that bothers me is the following. If you think in microscopically about what's going on in the mirror, the, there's a coherent, uh, excitation of all the electrons in the mirror which are vibrating and recreating the wave going in a direction and those electrons if you move those electrons then a Doppler shifts the wave however that's not going on in this moving ref ref reflectivity front Nothing, no, none of the electrons in the material that are recreating the wave are actually have, have a lateral motion and so and, there, and there, therefore there, should, there, there shouldn't be a Doppler shift and so I, I really think there's a qualitative difference between a moving mirror and a moving reflective front made by just turning things on and off. There's, the way I've been thinking about this is that this is essentially a positive displacement vacuum pump. Right? It's not intended to increase the pressure or the force of the vacuum, but it's intended to move it and just provide a, a momentum to it by just rapidly pushing it rather than increasing a pressure. So it's not really a pump per se, it's a much more of a fan. Keep in mind, I'm pressures, temperatures, and flow rates guy. I'm not a, I'm not a physicist, but I, I see this as something that's displacing the vacuum and causing that, full, that to the velocity of the vacuum in that direction, whereas it's different from like increasing a pressure or trying to modify it in some way. Yeah, but there's a positive old... displacement part of it of putting things in the way to kind of push it. Is that kind of how? Well, yeah, but uh, the problem is we plague our graduate students with, with, which is what's the difference between a piston, which is moving a compressing a gas by moving forward, right. and, or, or, or is moving backwards and releasing pressure on a gas, yeah. and a bunch of barriers which are breaking one by one by one a vein and pump. letting it open. And it turns out there's a qualitative difference Very between much those so. two situations. A vein pump versus a piston pump. Yeah, yeah. One, does, one does pressure, the other one just adds velocity. Yeah, yeah. Very different. Right, so this is an adding velocity, not a pressure modification. That's how I'm thinking about yeah. this. But. Well, let me, uh, yeah, just let me comment on that. Uh, now, now, of course, I, I, I had the same thought that you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I am past the graduate st student stage. <laughs> but, um, uh, and yeah, I take your point to that, you, you know, uh, uh, if you're thinking about a, uh, a metallic uh, mirror, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's that, that's correct. However, there are there are there are, there's a suite of technologies out there that doesn't uh, isn't limited to semiconductors. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned uh, ch chiral liquid liquid crystals. Uh, those those can. Um, uh, transition continuously when they when this guy sees a little light coming through this guy it is activated so what we're trying to do we're not we're not in fact that, that's that's the reason I use the word reflectivity rather than um, charge carrier density because uh, of uh, m m m my belief that possibly the, the chiral liquid crystal scheme is the best one at least to try for now. Okay. A closely related question to the energy question is where does the momentum come from? Yeah. 
<laughs> Does it leave anything in its wake as it goes along? Oh, uh, well, uh, the... Uh, uh, once the uh, once the reflective surfaces are turned off, uh, the the entire the 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 the, two, the the reflected waves simply travel outward, and uh, at least in the vicinity, you're left with the original vacuum state. And one of those has a higher frequency than the, than the other, and therefore they have different momentum. They, they have, the, yeah, they have, they they that's where the momentum have, transfer they, n they not only have higher frequencies uh, than one another, but uh, the frequency is varying as, as you accelerate. Yeah, but the, so. the things that come out the two sides have different frequencies, and therefore there's a differential momentum associated with those photons. That's right. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you, Doug. So how do you um, how do you ensure a 100% orthogonal incident angle for the initial? Oh, oh no, uh, I don't. Okay. Uh, uh, the uh, the idea of uh, introducing a one-dimensional uh, approximation was mm -hmm. uh, simply to to show uh, to show this idea of an iconal treatment uh, to show. Uh, that uh, that uh, the reverberated waves going in different directions uh, basically are uncorrelated, mm -hmm. and thus thus one can look at the momentum density rather than the whole thing, uh, and it assume but but the general uh, uh, results assume uh, uh, all possible uh, angles of incidence. And so on, and, and it just turns out that uh, my my guess about the w one dimensional approximation uh, provided a pretty good approximation to the general case, but because of o uh, over overbounds and underbounds. Um, so uh, yeah, but the uh, I, I spent ninety percent of my time trying to figure out the general case, and <laughs> it was a lot of work. Why don't we thank the speaker and have a, a ten minute break before the next speaker starts?